So I am so excited about today. I am here with Jenna Rosso. She is a pediatric functional medicine practitioner who we luckily just got in to see. Um, I have known about you for so long because I feel like the Austin um, like wellness community is very tight knit. And so, you know, like the big names in Austin and, um, I, you know, working with my functional medicine doctor changed my life and gave me my life back. And so I knew that I, when I got pregnant, I wanted to find someone that, um, could help my baby from the get go. Cause how powerful would that be for him now that I know what I know, um, about taking this approach. And so, I'm super, super excited to be working you with you. I'm super, super excited to be talking to you. Um, I get questions all the time on TikTok and Instagram about how people can support their children in this way. So I know everyone's going to be all ears for this podcast. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Faith. I'm excited to be chatting today. Yeah, I am so excited. I have so many questions for you, but I think the question that... Um, almost feels most important. And I ask this to everyone because everyone, when they get into this space where they're spearheading something super unique, has a story, right? That propelled them into the direction that they're in. And so I'd love to hear from you. Like, how did you get here? Is this something that you always wanted to do? And you were like, this is, you know, I want to make this difference and do something super unique. Or was there something that was this catalyst that propelled you in this direction? Oh, yes. There's, um, you know, a, a long story to that. And I think even from when I was probably seven or eight, my mom saved this paper, you know, the papers you fill out at school that are like, what's your favorite color? And what do you want to be when you grow up? And mine was always pediatrician. That was always what I wanted to do um, from the get go. So I had that kind of ingrained in me. And Honestly, I don't know why, because nobody in my family was working as a medical professional. So I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. Um, but I think it's important to talk about my childhood and how I dealt with a lot of health issues because it really laid the platform for me um, as you know, a future functional medicine provider, which I never knew I would be. Um, but I, you know, I grew up having so many GI issues, just chronic stomach aches. I was always sick. I was always complaining about my head and my stomach. And, you know, this was in the 80s. So it was kind of like, oh, you're fine. And or we don't know what's wrong with you, but you're fine. Um, and I grew up in your typical household where my parents were working, uh, we were, you know, eating on the go. I was a, a competitive gymnast and played a lot of sports. And so it was like, you know, you go to one sport, you grab McDonald's, you go to the next, you know, you drink your chocolate milk. Um, and we woke up and would eat our toaster strudels. And I know everyone from the eighties can appreciate that, but you know, there wasn't much, um, you know, much space or time for wellness and pre for prevention. And so as I got a little bit older, my parents ended up taking me to a GI doctor and they were like, oh, well, you know, I think you just have a lactose issue. So we need you to start buying lactose free milk but otherwise you're fine. And so that never really solved any problems for me. Um, and I just kind of muscled through it. I was always on antibiotics, you know, we had strep all the time or ear infections. I had pretty bad acne in high school. So the answer was a daily antibiotic for years. Um, and I know this is like a lot of people can relate to this story. Um, so it wasn't until college when I was on my own and my dad got diagnosed with celiac disease that I really started taking the reins and trying to figure out why I was always sick. You know, this is, this can't be normal. I shouldn't have to deal with this for the rest of my life. And so I ended up going and seeing um, a GI doctor myself. And they, of course, tested me for celiac disease at the time because they thought that for sure that's what was going on. Um, and that was negative. Um, and then they were like, well, we don't know what to tell you. You're you just go about your life. And I said, no, I have been sick my whole life. I need answers. Like, I need you to tell me what I can eat 
is what I'm eating making me sick? And how can I get better? And they, they said, well, your food allergy panel is normal. So you should be eating, just eat whatever you want. And they kind of swept me out the door, you know. And at the time, of course, that was incredibly frustrating. And I thought that I would never find answers. Um, but I was dating my husband at the time. Um, we were dating and he was really into um, nutrition and started reading more about eating paleo and cutting out grains and cutting out sugar. And, you know, it must have been a God thing because he said, I think you would really feel better if you ate this way instead of how you're used to eating. And I was incredibly resistant. Um, you know, I think I was, I was working as a nurse at the time in the hospital. And, and, and so I said, well, if you're going to cook for me, I will eat it. <laughs> and so he did. And he, he cooked for me and all whole food meals and more healthy fats and really cutting out grains and sugar and, and soy and gluten and dairy. And I did. I started feeling better. And so that was really the window into my health and healing. Um, and, and kind of parallel to that, I had gotten into UT. I had gotten into their nursing school. Um, I was learning the mainstream way and working at the hospital. And then I did do the pediatric nurse practitioner program. And that is when I dove into the primary care world. And I hadn't, you know, this was a little behind my own journey. So I hadn't really figured out paleo yet. But I was working in, in an incredibly busy practice where I was seeing probably 30 or 40 kids per day. It was like 10 minute visits. It was really nuts. Um, incredibly just stressful and, you know, antibiotics, steroids, topical, you know, the typical stuff. Um, and, and after a few years of that, I really, I got so burnt out and ended up joining just a different primary care office. This was a little bit less busy. Mm -hmm. um, but then my partner, Emily, who I, I partner with now, we own Neuro Nutrition. She called me up one day and she said, I've been reading and learning about functional medicine. And I think this is really what this is up your alley. This is something you would really be interested in because it was around the time that I was doing the paleo thing, you know, and I started looking into it and, you know, going to conferences and sure enough, it was kind of like this whole world open for me, more answers for myself, but also for, you know, the patients that I was seeing. And so that was kind of the beginning of the birth of our clinic, our neuro nutrition clinic. Yeah, and it's funny that you say that because I feel like everybody has that moment where they learn about functional medicine and all of a sudden it's like this, like, ooh, like it makes sense now. <laughs> and like, it's not in my head or it's not just the way that it is or like things things can actually be better. Like there can actually be some data. There can actually be some answers. Um, and it's so crazy to like go your whole life, like thinking one way and then find out that this is there. Um <laughs> And especially because so many of my friends are Western medicine trained. Um, and so like they know their stuff. But when we dip into this world, it's all brand new and sometimes contradictory. Um, and so I love having the conversations and picking people's brains, coming from all different perspectives. But um, I think it's really fascinating in relation to pediatrics because so many of us have stories like I relate so much to your story. And so many of us have stories where it's like, this was my life year after year. It got worse. It was chronic boom, I figured it out. I'm now feeling amazing. But thinking about like, what can we do now that we know better for our children to prevent that being their story? Um, and I think that that's really fascinating. And so I like, I just can't wait to learn more about it. But let's start. So at this point, you go to these conferences, you learn about functional medicine. So was your clinic not functional or like integrative at the time? It was more just like a traditional allopathic model? 
So the one that I was working in prior to neuronutrition, it was all allopathic. Um, they're really, you know, I, I joke about probably the most holistic thing we offered was telling patients to take a probiotic when you put them on an antibiotic. Okay. You know, I really had that down really well. Um, but otherwise, there wasn't a lot of conversations about nutrition. Um, you know, if a kid came in with focus issues or ADHD or behavior issues, it was, okay, well, here's your referral to psych, or here's your referral for a neuropsych test, or here's your prescription for a stimulant medication. Um, so that was the, the typical course. And, you know, um, thankfully, I knew Emily from school. And, you know, she brought me back into this world that she had entered. And it was really a, a steep learning curve for me, a huge learning curve. And, and like you said, going to that initial conference, it was, a, it was a pediatric conference, the Medical Academy of Pediatric Special Needs, um, where I was going to really learn more about autism, because that was really the focus of our clinic, to serve the autistic population, um, really learn how we can treat them more than just sending them to therapy. And so I remember sitting in that, that uh, lecture, those lectures, and my mind was blown. You know, I was learning about all of these things that I had never heard before, the research to support them, you know, all these brilliant practitioners in one room. And, you know, I thought, where has this been? Why didn't I learn about this in nursing school? And where has this information been? Um, so that was really really just eye-opening to me and set the stage for us hitting the ground running with neuronutrition. Um, so yeah, that was kind of how that took off. And in your practice now, what do you, I, I know you focus a lot on autism. Is that like your specialty? Because I know we're, we're maybe, I don't know if we're an anomaly or not. We're kind of in there just to make sure that we're doing all the right things and optimizing and all of that. Do you have that specific focus or how does that work? You know, at first we were focusing on autism, but then we started getting more cases of, well, my child has chronic stomach aches or chronic infection, and then even prevention, you know, okay, my child isn't really unhealthy. I don't have a lot of big concerns about them, but I really want to make sure that we don't end up mm -hmm. in this spot where we are concerned about things. Um, and so that we do have a mishmash. And then at one point, maybe two or three years ago, we started seeing more children with pandas, um, which is an autoimmune disorder that the immune system attacks these receptors in the brain. And then you're left with these behavioral symptoms like severe OCD and anxiety and bedwetting and aggression um, and tics. And so that kind of flooded our doors and we started seeing more and more of that. Um, and so I would say now we see such a variety and it's not only autism, but it's a little bit of everything. Um, and so you're not the anomaly, you're not an anomaly. Um, and I appreciate seeing kids that are in our practice for prevention because I feel like you know, when you know more, then you can do more for your child. And, you know, if, if you're there and you're saying, I want to know more so that I don't end up in a place where I'm backtracking and trying to clean up what's going on, then you're in such a good place to make those decisions. Totally. And I think as with all my conversations, I really want to reframe it in that way so that people feel really confident about making the investment because it's not a decision on the provider side to not take insurance. It's a problem with insurance. Um, and I always want to get that point across because it can be kind of a shock, less so for Americans because we are used to paying for our healthcare versus something like the UK where we're moving, which is even more of a kind of like shock to the system to, to have to kind of dish out, if you will. But I always want to get this point across. It's much more expensive to deal with a chronic condition, not just financially, but emotionally, physically, like in every way. And, and so really and truly, it's a much cheaper option to focus on prevention. And like, if we can get to a place, as I'm sure you agree, where everyone feels like um, this is absolutely the right thing to do, make the investment on the front end, work on the prevention. I mean, it would change the world. So I'm hoping to yes. get that, that point across. Um, and 
And yeah, I mean, I'm so excited. I know I have an appointment coming up with you like next week. And we did um, a functional medicine test kit for Leo, which is amazing because like I didn't get to do that kit until I was like 25 and it changed my life. So I'm so excited to think about like what's going to, you know, what his opportunities are going to be um, now that we were able to do that. And um, I'm sure we can kind of maybe delve into some of these things as well. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I thought it would be nice to have a focus here just on, talking about maybe the first year of life and we can kind of expand on that because people also will have mm-hmm. kids who are five, six, 10, whatever. But just thinking sure. about some like fundamental principles that um, we should be aware of and some steps we can put into place to support our children from a preventative standpoint. Mm-hmm. And maybe in, at the end, we can touch a little bit on if someone's symptomatic, but in general, and I tell my clients, like if you're symptomatic, you have to just go and, and see someone and get tested because mm-hmm. um, it has to be tailored to what's going on. Um, Mm -hmm. which is why the best investment is actually seeing the right doctor instead of paying for this, that, or the other supplement from someone who Mm -hmm. is qualified. And, and it's not, Mm -hmm. it's just not going to work if it's not the right, right treatment. So yeah, I think Mm -hmm. prevention is probably a really good place because this could apply to everyone. Um, talking about the first year of life, where would we start? Like, what's some good, what are some good principles? What's some good knowledge to have um, for people who are like, yeah, I'm behind this. I want to start setting my kid up for success. Okay. That is just an amazing topic. And I think we have to even go, we have to go upstream, right, from that. And I want to talk a little bit about my first baby because Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I was not in the know. I didn't have those tools and so for, for people who are planning a family, um, and that's, of course, when, you, when it's the best time to think about all of this, and many people are way past that point. But when you're planning a family, thinking about your own health, you know, am I eating whole foods? Is my gut health aligned? What is my history? Um, what is my medical history? Am I sleeping well? How is my stress level? And I want to lay the stage for you here because you heard my childhood. So I had severe gut dysbiosis. I was eating things that I couldn't eat, that I had severe sensitivities to. I was working at a primary care office that was incredible incredibly stressful. Um, I was on birth control that I got off probably a month before I got pregnant, which if you've got, if you guys have been tapped into the functional world, you will know that birth control can deplete you of um, very essential nutrients such as folate. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was my story. And, and I was still in that busy clinic. I ended up getting pregnant And so here I am working 40 hours a week on my feet, no lunch break, or maybe like five minutes for lunch. It was just, you know, really stressful. Um, And thinking I'm doing the best, you know, thinking I'm taking care of myself, that I'm doing what I need to do for my baby. Um, And then I go into preterm labor. And, you know, of course, my doctor's like, whoa. And I'm thinking, I mean, I'm stressed out every day working this horrible job. Of course, I'm going into preterm labor. So I get put on bed rest. Um, And then I was on bed rest till I had my first babe. And so that I think, you know, even before you have your baby, go like, think ahead, think about what is my job like? You know, what is my health like? Can I get testing done to look at my microbiome? Can I reduce the toxins in my life? You know, I was still at a point in my life then when I was burning my Yankee candles and using bleach and Clorox in my bathroom and Tide for my laundry detergent. And and I know there are still many people in that space. So this is a good time to think through all of those things. Um, And then our first baby was born. And unfortunately, because he was born to me, who had not done a lot of work on myself, he was premature extremely colicky. Um, We had just the hardest time with him. He had severe reflux um, and just a hard time breastfeeding. I think I cried every day for probably the first four months of his life. He never slept. And so, you know, kind of thinking through those things now and knowing what I know now, um, you know, just kind of starting from square one and saying, oh my goodness, well, he probably... He had my food sensitivities. He would have benefited if I would have right then and there started changing my diet, taking out these things from my diet. Um, instead, we, you know, followed our, our at the time pediatrician's recommendations and put him on an antacid mm-hmm. um, that didn't help very much. 
And so I wish I would have known a lot of what I know now to, to investigate lip and tongue tie. He has a lip and a tongue tie, and that was never really evaluated. Um, and so these are some of the prominent things that I went through with him. And it wasn't until he was about six to nine months old that I started doing all that work to a diet elimination, gut health, doing more stool studies, um, figuring out why, like why this was happening. And so I say all of that because there are so many moms that have gone through that and are going through that. And maybe if somebody reached out to them and said, hey, this could be something that you're eating, that he's getting through your breast milk that his body doesn't like, you know, and it could be as easy as taking it out of your diet. Or it could be that he has a prominent tongue tie that's affecting his feeding and affecting his reflux and you know, finding a provider that can look at that and evaluate that could solve so many issues for you. Um, or it could be that, you know, your baby was born to a mama that had chronic yeast in her gut and now baby has chronic yeast. And so that's affecting his stools and his tummy and how he's behaving. And so all these things that, no, you know, I never knew. I didn't know at the time, you know. And so that really... I think if you compare my first child to my second, it's so apparent when I got into functional medicine. It's just super interesting. Yeah, well, that really resonated with me because um, so I started working with my functional medicine provider about two years before I got pregnant. The year um, in the run up to conception, she she really specializes in um, fertility and postpartum and all of that. Um, that's like her focus in her functional medicine clinic. And so she worked with me for a full year, um, after we had gone in and healed my gut, but I did every, I actually did every test she had in her practice. Cause I was like, let's just go hard on fixing all the problems. And it worked. Um, but we did, we fixed a lot. And of course I had SIBO and candida. I had all that going on a year after we healed it. Um, we went really hard on repleting, you know, the damage from birth control and, so many other things. Um, and we just optimized everything for conception. I got pregnant on the first try. I had a really healthy pregnancy and my baby has been really healthy. Um, beyond, um, the fact that he didn't want to come out, um, so I was pregnant forever. Um, everything went really well. And I a hundred percent, and I tell this to everyone, um, I'm sure maybe in life that every, you know, there's something is luck, I guess, but I truly believe that, um, it was all of that effort. And interestingly, alongside me, many of my friends are on the journey of wanting to conceive or having issues with conceiving. And, um, they are spending so much money and they are truly exhausted and in pain for, you know, what they're going through. And the questions that I'm asking are not questions that their practitioners who are specialists, you know, they're not asking. So beyond even, you know, having success conceiving and then beyond that, like you said, um, the health of your pregnancy and your baby, like no one's asking these questions. No one's preparing people. I am not personally, I did not use an ob -GYN. I used a midwife and I used my functional medicine doctor. Mm -hmm. I tried to go to an ob -GYN. Um, she, she didn't ask the question. She didn't test my thyroid. I've had a Graves mm -hmm. disease. It was a little odd to me. Um, and so we had no talk with no discussion on nutrition. I'm not saying this is the case with everyone, but you see the stark contrast and I want to shout it from the rooftops. And so I'm interested to see about your second pregnancy because I don't have that experience. Um, but I'm, I'm certain that it's going to be a similar story to mine. The power of taking this root cause functional approach, even before, especially hopefully before you conceive and the impact that has on the health of your pregnancy and your, your postpartum and your baby, all of it, all of it. Yeah, absolutely. It is so important. And like I said, many people don't have that luxury because they are beyond this point, you know, right. they already have children, they're, you know, a little bit older, whatnot. And, and they, you know, they didn't have this knowledge back then. But if you do, and you are in that preconception stage, it is just so vital for you to take those steps. And like you said, to really dive into how can I help my body be its healthiest so that I can have a healthy baby. And it's not only great for your baby, but it's so important for your mental stability as a mom, you know? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. 
postpartum, I mean, absolutely. Like there are ways to prepare yourself for that period of life so that you can be the best version of yourself for your baby, because it's hard no matter what. It's easier if you both are set up for success. Um, okay. Postpartum is the best I've ever felt. I 100% attribute it to working with my practitioner, um, all of that work that I put in with her. And she's just amazing with the dedication she has you know, put to studying this. And most of it was around, I have to say, it was around nutrition. Nutrition and lifestyle. I already detoxed my life, so I don't use any of it. You know, it was the nutrition optimization and the really targeted supplementation that I truly believe is is why I was able to really bounce back and just feel so incredible. But that being said, that's a place to start, but all is not lost if we haven't done that because there's still so much we can do if we already have our kids. Can we just quickly touch on your second pregnancy and how that was different now that you kind of know what you know or you knew what you knew? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I kind of mentioned um, – previously how I had been dating my husband, Steven, and he introduced me to paleo and I had been feeling great. But then when I got pregnant with my first baby, I really fell off the wagon with that. And I think a lot of people can relate, you know, you're pregnant, you don't feel great, you're nauseous, you kind of eat whatever sounds good. And so I just wasn't doing a good job at that point. I was eating, you know, gluten and dairy, which I now know are, are basically poison for my body. Um, and so Fast forward, so I, I had this whole experience with this child, and and when he was about 15 months old is when we started neuronutrition. Mm. So then I started really testing anything and everything on myself, trying to figure out, oh, well, this makes so much sense now. Let me figure out what else is going on, looking at my gut microbiome, looking at food sensitivities, looking at, um, you know, my methylation and, and why that was super detrimental for me to be on birth control and then get pregnant right away. Because I have two, I have compound heterozygous MTHFR. And so I don't break down folic acid. Um, and you know, those multivitamins I was taking all growing up with added folic acid were really not great for my body. Um, so I start learning all of these pieces of information. I really rain, pull in the reins on my diet. I'm like, okay, this is not a joke anymore. I can't be eating whatever I want. And so I go back to more of a whole foods diet, really focusing on healthy fats, no sugar, no grains or very minimal grains and start feeling amazing, start feeling better. Um, and then cleaning up my gut, I start getting on certain supplements that are really necessary for my body. And then once we decided to have a second baby, um, my pregnancy was night and day. It was just incredible. I felt great. I loved every minute of it. I knew that stress was a big uh, enemy for me and for my pregnancy. And so I maintained a very low stress. I mean, I know I had a toddler, so there's only so much you can do. But I wasn't working at that clinic where I didn't get to sit down and I didn't get to eat lunch and I was incredibly stressed. So that was a huge change for me. Um, and I was supporting my baby with the certain nutrients that I know I needed during pregnancy, eating great foods. And he was actually overdue. I didn't think he would come out. <laughs> So that was the first very stark contrast. He, I went almost 41 weeks with him um, and labor was great. He was a healthy, big old nine pound boy. And so off the bat, he was much healthier, you know, a better feeder. He never had reflux, no issues with feeds, no colic. No, I mean, just total stark contrast. And you know, for the most part, had a better temperament, even as a toddler. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so I, I just, I attribute all that I learned and all that knowledge I gained. And then of course, doing all the work on my own self, um, as to how, how better of an experience that was. And so even if you have one or two children now, and you didn't have that opportunity before, but you want more kids, you can still do that now. And, and um, even maybe have a better experience. So I'm always just very sympathetic with clients that I see who, uh, you know, they've gone through that and more. Um, I just, I've been down that road and I know, and it's not easy, but there are tools. There are tools out there. Um, even if you're seeing providers that aren't giving you those tools, there, there are tools with other people, you know? Totally. 
that's funny. I didn't, I don't know if that's a sign of a healthy pregnancy, your baby not wanting to come out because I, <laughs> I basically time, well, I was 24 hours timing out of the birthing center because I was 10 months pregnant. And they said, you're now high risk. So you either get this baby out or you're yeah. going to the hospital. Um, and I induced naturally. So I didn't have to use Pitocin. It's kind mm-hmm. of a lot of effort, but it worked. And um, uh, even then he didn't want to come out. But the labor was really good in the sense that um, even though I labored for 50 hours, it was very calm. Like it was very, you know, I labored at home mm-hmm. until I had to push. And I didn't even call my doula because I didn't even think I was, I didn't do any cervical checks. I opted out mm-hmm. um, until I was ready to push. And I just kind of, I did a sort of like listening to my body thing. And um, that being said, like I said, because I didn't have a cervical check, I thought, it's fine. It's fine. And then I ended up having to do a hospital transfer because he didn't want to come out. Um, and then it was getting sort of in a weird place, dangerous. But um, I went to a hospital. They had midwives, which was really cool. I did my first cervical check and she was like, yeah, you're fully dilated. Like you need to push. But it's weird because he never wanted to come out. I never felt the urge to push. I had to induce. The whole thing was kind of a weird, wow. unexpected thing. But I don't know if that's a sign, what that means. But he did not want to come out, that baby, <sighs> that child. He was comfortable. He was comfy. Well, one of one of us was comfortable at that point. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He was exactly. a big, big baby too. So, like what you were saying, I was like, this. Yeah. Okay. So, so what's let's talk about like um, first year of life. What are some like core things, some fundamental principles that we should be implementing um, that are going to exponentially increase our likelihood of being healthy throughout you know duration of our, our lives. Okay. So, you know, first thing I think of is the actual birth. And a lot of people are blessed that they get to do a vaginal birth, which is amazing. Um, But there are a lot of babies born C-section now. And so the first thing that I think about is there, you know, when you're born C-section, you are not inoculated properly with Uh, that bacteria that is supposed to be your microbiome's first inoculation. And so you're really brought into this sterile environment as a C-section baby. And one of the, the coolest things I learned in my conferences way back when, you know, many years ago, was that there are OBs that are practicing where they will swab mom's vaginal canal and actually inoculate baby in the ears, mouth, nares, you know, everywhere that they would be going through the birth canal, they need that inoculation. Um, And so that was being practiced. And I thought, that is incredible. I've never heard of this Mm -hmm. before, but it should be. Why are we not doing more of this? So that would be the first thing I would really push for if it were me and I had to have a C-section. I would say, we need to do this so that my baby's gut microbiome can start out really healthy. Um, And then, you know, the next thing that comes to mind, of course, is feeding. That's pretty much the, you know, after you're doing skin to skin, your baby wants to eat. And um, I think now we do a good job of really encouraging moms to breastfeed. We have a lot of lactation support. Um, You know, I had just the best experience with my lactation consultant. So I would just say to really Um, continue to push for that for your own baby. Um, Even if you're having feeding difficulties, find a lactation support uh, or consultant. If you're really having trouble, once again, get those, get the baby's mouth looked at for Mm -hmm. lip or tongue tie. Um, And a lot of lactation consultants do that now. So they're really um, well-trained to look for that for feeding issues. But it's very easy to want to give up on that, especially if you aren't producing milk well, if your baby's not latching well, if you're going back to work. I've been there too, you know. Um, But that's, you know, mom's milk is one of the things that God gave us for our babies. And so if, if you can at all, you know, even a short amount of time breastfeed your baby, it's so important for their Um, overall their immunity and their gut health. Um, Okay, so let's think a little bit more. Um, I'm going through the the cycle here. I want to talk a bit about reflux because I think that's something that most people encounter at some point. Um, And some babies have it very mildly, so it's not a really huge deal. And then others were having just vomiting after every meals. And of course, there can be more acute issues that 
that you need to see your pediatrician for. But I think that that, you know, reflux should not be deemed normal and antacids should not be deemed normal as a newborn. There should be always the question of why is this happening? Um, and so I want to really empower moms to take that into their hands if they're not getting answers and say, I'm worried about a food sensitivity. I'm worried about maybe a lip or tongue tie. I'm worried about my milk supply. You know, maybe I'm overproducing and baby's drowning in milk. And how can I really regulate this so that she's not spitting up after every meal? Because the generic answer is, okay, your baby's spitting up, here's an antacid and, you know, stay on that until they're sitting up and their, you know, their sphincter um, is more mature and they're not spitting up anymore. But long term, that can do so much damage and, and cause low stomach acid. And then you're looking at problems that you have to clean up down the road. So I just want to encourage parents that it's not, you know, it should not be normal for a baby to spit up that much and it shouldn't be normal to just throw them on a medication. Um, Mm -hmm. So just really empower people to find those answers. Stop me at any point. No, no, I was just saying that resonates with me because we had that issue with, with Leo, like he did spit up a lot and we were given a lot of different medications, which we did, we didn't use, but um, I would say like, like you said, lactation consultants are some of the most <laughs> lactation consultants, midwives and doulas. Like we should have a holiday for all three. And they're all so willing <laughs> to come help you come to your house. The amount of times my lactation consultant has been there, like she knows me personally. She's worked with my nanny. Like we they will do anything to help see, you know, see you successfully nurse your baby. And so don't like hesitate to reach out or like just because like the dynamic is, is really wonderful and they're just absolutely your advocate. So like mm-hmm. if, if you want someone to help you find answers, your lactation consultant probably is going to be that person and they'll be part of a network. So maybe they can help you find other like more holistic practitioners in your area or pediatric dentists and stuff like that. So I would definitely encourage people if you haven't. Um, yeah, because I, I had uh, two different lactation consultants. They were amazing. Yeah, another really vital person that existed in my life when my kids were really little was my sleep consultant. Mm. Um, (laughs) Because they, I mean, she just was so incredible. Strong Little Sleepers is her business here locally. Um, But I think all of us as moms and dads, we know what it's like to be incredibly sleep deprived, to try and put your baby down for that nap and they wake up five minutes after you set them down. And just not know what to do. But once again, you know, when you're looking at the overall health of you and your baby, sleep is a huge pillar in that health, uh, that, you know, your healthy lifestyle. And so if your baby's not sleeping, then you're not sleeping. Then everybody's upset. Your immune system is not functioning well. Your stress is higher. Um, So finding a sleep consultant that can work with you and give you tips and help you help your baby sleep. That was a huge finding for us too. I mean, that was life changing. Life changing. Leo was like nursing every five minutes, and I also hired a sleep consultant, and she had a non cry it out approach. And I think the difference with a sleep consultant, there are a lot of programs which I tried, but you have to tailor it. Like everything, like babies are just they're individual people, so you can't just use the generic whatever with your child. And I think. Um, what a good investment because when your baby's sleeping then they're happier and also i found for me like nursing was more productive because they were getting he started getting really long great satisfying feeds versus these random snacks which seemed to be the only thing that would calm him down as a new mom i didn't really know what to do so that's that's definitely a good point um we use little wink sleep i don't know it's different than what you use but they're they're a non-cried out approach i don't know and, and yeah. they were wonderful and helpful in that sense Oh, good. I mean, we need all the right, all the help in that department. So it's good. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, kind of walking through, um, I think the next big thing is nutrition when you're starting to introduce baby foods and solids, you know, and everybody's real excited to do that. You know, I remember um, when I was doing primary care, parents would kind of walk through to the, the door with their four month old and they're like, okay, can we start solids? I'm really excited. 
Um, and so my approach has always been no earlier than six months old. And if you can hold them off a little bit longer, then that's great. You know, and if you're breastfeeding, let's just keep going with that. They're getting wonderful nutrition. Um, but as you do approach that, the first foods are vital Mm -hmm. and what you're putting on your child's plate, you know, I'm sure everyone is, is coming around to the idea that diet really makes a difference in your health. And so if you start young and really introduce them to whole foods and healthy fats, then not only are you nourishing their body and providing their brains with what they need um, to, to learn at that age, but you're also setting up their palate and you're setting up their gut microbiome. Okay. And so I think that this is so huge because you can prevent a lot of illness based on what you start feeding your baby at an early age. And so I like, you know, first foods, I think about things like avocado, um, salmon, um, bone broth, if you can make a liver beef liver puree or you know do something with with beef liver that is just an incredibly nutrient dense food um, egg yolk is another one that i highly recommend and so stay away from all of these processed crackers and little munchy things because those are just going to not only are they just filler foods Um, But they're not nutrient packed. And if anything, they're fortified with vitamins. So it's really unnatural Mm. for the body to take those things in. And so whole foods is the goal. Do you have um, any sort of resources? We used a book which sort of outlined um, what you're saying. And I knew that was helpful for me as a new mom to kind of like follow those recipes and know like when to introduce wheat. We started with pate and then yolk and then avocado, uh-huh. but it was a book. It was a book that I used. So do you have any recommendations for listeners who are like, ooh, this sounds interesting. What's a good resource? Oh, man, you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> I'm forgetting my books. <laughs> I can also just drop them in the show notes. I know we use something called Super Nutrition for Babies, and that outlined the diet that you um uh, just mention and my doctor recommended that, but I'm sure you've got, and mm-hmm. I can add them in the show notes, whatever recommendations you might have. for. for- okay. I found one that I really loved. It's nourished beginnings, baby food. Mm-hmm. Um, that was one that I liked. And then there's, I, I always went to, um, the paleo mom's website. She has a good guide for baby nutrition, like starting baby nutrition. Mm-hmm. So that's the paleo mom.com. So those were a couple that I used. Um, I think Weston Price has a good resource as well. Do you follow them, Faith? I don't, but I will start. I love um, it. I love also Danielle Walker's resources. Um, she she has her Against the Grain cookbook, and you know, and I always tell my parents too, like it doesn't need to be complicated. You know, if you're making yourself, let's say you're making yourself salmon, sweet potatoes, and broccoli, you know, you can either puree some of that sweet potato, give your baby a little bit of the salmon, depending on their age, they can do a little bit of broccoli. If you're doing baby wet lead weaning, you can put some of these things on their plate and let them experiment with it. You know, it and, and that really, I think, as a society, we need to move away from And this is an unpopular belief right here, unpopular opinion. But, you know, the kids menu is just junk for our kids. And if we can move away from that and we can teach our kids that what mommy and daddy eat is what you should be eating, then I think our children as a society would be so much healthier. And so that starts from the beginning. You know, don't make your baby an extra meal just based on what you're cooking. Make sure that they get some of what you're eating. And then, of course, fermented foods is such a huge part of that, too. And if you can get a little bit of homemade kefir or yogurt or a little bit of sauerkraut juice onto whatever you're cooking, you're just automatically introducing some of these amazing uh, bacteria for their gut flora. And so already they're going to be so much healthier. And in terms of, let's say someone wants to make pate, how... Where should what should they be looking for for their fish and their for their meat to make sure they're getting good quality um, mm-hmm. animal? Product? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I mean, shopping at a good grocery store, I am, you know, very keen on Whole Foods, <laughs> which my husband likes to call Whole Paycheck. Um, but really, you know, <laughs> he's going to listen to this and laugh because yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I mean, I don't disagree with him, but you know, if you don't have access to an amazing farmer's market, which would be probably mm-hmm. the best place to get your, your meats and your fish, um, because you know, this farmer, they're down the road, they can tell you exactly what their cows eat, exactly what their chickens eat, you know, how they raise them, etc. Of course, that's going to be number one. Mm-hmm. Um, or I do, you know, and we've done this, and I have neighbors that do this, where you find a farmer that's selling a half of a cow or whatever the animal may be that you can deep freeze so that you also, once again, you know where your meat is coming from. Okay. And that's a little, that's tricky in the grocery store, but if I'm shopping, I'm looking for grass fed beef or, you know, um, free range chicken. I'm looking for no antibiotics, no hormones, um, grass finished. So that was something that was kind of, I learned about in the meat department was you can have a, a grass fed animal that is not finished on grass before they are brought Mm -hmm. to the slaughterhouse. We will say, um, they're given like trash and corn maybe a few days before or whatnot. And so, what you are eating is also what this animal ate, right? Or what this animal was given if they were given antibiotics to to get them fatter, if they were given hormones, or, you know, if you're, if the milk you're drinking came from a cow that was given hormones and antibiotics. And so um, that I think is really important to know what kind of meat am I buying? If you're buying fish, you do not want farm raised fish. You want wild caught, you know, um, even if you can, like I said, I go to the local farmer's market if they're selling fish there and get that. If you have a relative that loves to go fishing and, and they're bringing back, um, you know, fish from somewhere that they've gone, um, it's, it is important to avoid a lot of those things because that's just another added toxin into our bodies. And even if you have a child that has never had an antibiotic, but they're eating meat that is really poor quality, then technically they are getting that. They're ingesting that. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I, I recently learned the grass finished, but I, um, there's the, Texas, we're kind of lucky because we have some good farms. We've got space here, but I'm finding that like, even, you know, us moving to the UK, they, they've got plenty of farms there too. So I would venture to say that you can always Google um, like farms and there are farms that freeze and ship, I believe, because I've seen that on Instagram, Mm -hmm. you find farms that they absolutely love. Mm -hmm. Something that I always tell people, like you could follow like local, um, anyone in this community, like who's local on Instagram and then ping them a message because oftentimes like they'll know um, where, you know, wherever they're ordering their meat from if you don't have a Whole Foods because a lot of my clients don't have a Whole Foods nearby. I won't have a Whole Foods when I move. We're lucky in Austin. We've got like Whole Foods galore. Um, So so it's like my husband's probably super glad. Like you said, I'm sort of sad. We have a Whole Foods in London, but it's not the same. Um, so yeah, finding even like a local, local someone in this space, hopefully they mm-hmm. should have um, a resource. But I think that's an important point because oftentimes we just like take chicken or meat off the mm-hmm. shelf or even in Whole Foods, not everything meets this criteria. A lot of the yeah. fresh fish is, is not wild caught Mm-mm. and anything that's like pre-seasoned I find is not organic, not grass fed, not mm-hmm. wild caught. So you do need to, to, to ask as well if it's like behind the counter and don't assume because it's Whole Foods or or even like Trader Joe's is the same thing. The meat isn't always the best quality. They've got some great stuff, but I don't love the meat at Trader Joe's. But Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, and we'll go to Sprouts and I'm trying to think of my other like favorite place, natural grocers, mm-hmm. you know, but there's just the Whole Foods is super close. So it's kind of my go-to, but you can also find grass-fed meats at um, – H-E-B even, Mm -hmm. you know, you just have to take your time and really read the labels and, and know what you're getting before you put it in your cart. Mm -hmm. What about, um, supplementation? What if someone's wondering, like, 
should my child be supplementing? And if so, um, the traditional, I don't know, this is going to sound very outdated, but I took like Flintstone vitamins and I'm Same. sure you did. Okay, yes. I'm sure that they're crap. Oh, yes. I don't know because I didn't read bottles when I was a child, but I would, mm-hmm. I would wonder people wondering, okay, if, if the, what you see at target on the shelf might not be the best option. I don't know, but I'm maybe what, what, how, where do people start? What do they go for? Oh, I know that is the million dollar question. And <laughs> you know, one thing I will say is that it's so common, um, for practitioners to recommend that you put your baby on rice cereal right away because rice cereal is fortified and fortified with iron. Um, and truly, you know, we are checking at well checks. That is one of the, the, the nutrients that we want to know these babies are not deficient in. So normally around like nine to 12 months, you're looking at an iron check. Um, sometimes six, well, no, normally nine to 12. But, you know, so there's a big push for this, this fortified rice cereal that's really hard for babies to digest. And so that's why I really aim for all the foods we talked about, the beef liver, the egg yolk, because you're getting iron in those um, and it's whole foods and your body can process that better. And it's not fortified, you know, it's, it's from the source. So that's step one. Now, you know, and of course, everyone needs to be working with their practitioner. And if your baby is actually anemic or needing a specific nutrient or supplement that they know um, the dose and whatnot. But if you're feeding your baby whole foods and you're getting all of this into them, it might not be that they need a bunch of supplementation, you know? So I will say that off the bat, you know, that most parents at that age at six months or, you know, even into close to 12 months, it's not always necessary to be giving your babies a bunch of vitamins, um, especially if you're feeding them well. They should be getting these nutrients from their diet. And that's why a variety is so important. Um, but, you know, some of the things I will say that we see that are most deficient in our patients, even at young ages, are going to be iron or ferritin. Uh, vitamin D is the big one. And of course, you know, you have your babies covered in sunscreen hats and whatnot. So it's not like they're getting vitamin D every day for 15 minutes directly on their, their skin. So that could be something that they're deficient in. Um, uh, you know, back when, like you said, when we were growing up, we were taking a generic multivitamin and multivitamins aren't the worst thing, if, especially if you have a picky eater, you know, I will acknowledge that not every baby is going to be eating whatever you put on their plate and it's going to be like a happy world when you feed your kid. Um, and so there's the time and place for things like a multivitamin. But you want to look at the quality of that multivitamin. You want to make sure there's not folic acid in that multivitamin. You know, um, issues in the methylation pathway with the breakdown of folic acid are extremely common. Um, And so I would look for a multi that has methylfolate in it because that is already broken down, easier to process and utilize. Um, I would look for a vitamin that doesn't have many ingredients in it, you know, one that doesn't have um, soy or, you know, um, added sugars, which is hard because a lot of multivitamins are gummies now. Um, And then a lot of them have just fillers like dyes and colors and they want to make it look real pretty. And I haven't looked at the Flintstone vitamin in a long time, but I'm sure all those things are in it. (laughs) Yeah. So this, the simpler you can get um, for a vitamin, the better. Um, Zinc is another one that we see that's commonly deficient. So often we'll recommend that for our children who are deficient in that. But, you know, we're, we're testing too, you know, testing, not guessing. Um, so a lot of our patients, they are taking vitamins that they truly need. And then we're monitoring lab work and saying, okay, your level looks great. Let's reduce or let's remove. Um, If we're doing lab tests like the methylation panels like we did on Leo, then we're talking about specific methylated vitamins we might need or um, support for their neurotransmitters. Or if you have a kid that is just refusing any and all foods that might contain omega fatty acids, um, then an omega supplement can be really helpful. Um, So it's definitely not a protocol to fit 
every child worldwide, like everybody needs these vitamins, but um, it's very tailored and unique to each child and, and maybe what they might be lacking in. So if someone is thinking, I want to get um, an understanding of if my child has any deficiencies because maybe I didn't know all of this about their diet or I'm not quite sure, how do they how do they go about getting this information? Um, I think that would yeah. be, you know. Yes. And that can be hard, you know, if you have a good relationship with your provider and you can say, hey, I know we're coming up on our iron check. I'd love to know what their vitamin D is. And I'd love to know what, you know, her zinc level is and a CBC or a CMP. Um, then that's what I would really advise to, to get that good working relationship with your doctor so that you can check those nutrients. Um, and, and some parents have that and some parents don't. And if you don't and you really want to explore that more, then maybe it's time to find, you know, a provider that does more functional or, or holistic um, care so that we can dive a little bit into that. Um, but like I said, it's more prevention, you know, so if you're already there for your well check and you're already doing labs and you just want to prevent and know that my baby, you know, has what they need or my toddler, then talk to your provider about it and ask to run those labs. And then it was also another question because you mentioned vitamin D. Um, so I get this asked a lot and I'd love to know what you recommend to your patients because I kind of always roll with my own punches on this in terms of vitamin D. A lot of people are covering their babies and or they're putting on sunscreen and then covering them anytime they're outside. What do you recommend when your clients ask you or your patients ask you, um, should I put sunscreen on my baby? Should I cover my baby? Because I know that's kind of a sensitive topic. Can you touch on that at all? Oh, it's so sensitive and hard because a lot of, I mean, babies are fair skinned, some of them, and their skin is very delicate. They can burn very easily. Um, if you're able to let your baby out in the sun for even five minutes with, you know, maybe in their diaper, um, then they're getting more natural vitamin D that way. And that's more advisable. Um, but depending on the fairness of their skin, you know, is where, of course, sunscreen and hats and clothing would come into play. And so it might not always be possible to get that direct sunlight every day. Um, but that would be my first preference, you know, even if it's five minutes, seven minutes. Um, and then, you know, secondary to that would be knowing where their vitamin D level is. And then if they need supplementation, getting them that. Um, now, I have recommended more often than not, if mom's still breastfeeding and she's taking a decent amount of vitamin D, then baby will get that because it's fat soluble going through the breast milk. And, and that's a really great way to ensure that baby's getting it that way. Um, but it is hard to advise, you know, okay, you should be supplemented by vitamin D without knowing their level mm -hmm. because you could be giving too much or you could be giving a tiny amount that's doing absolutely nothing. Yeah. And I learned, I don't know, have you heard of the app D minder? I haven't. Okay. What is it? So cool. So basically it tells you based off where your location is. Um, at what point in the day you can actually get vitamin D. And um, you can put in like your skin type and how much of your skin is showing. And it'll, it'll I don't know how accurate it is personally, but it'll, however accurate it is, tell you, um, you know, based on the duration of time you're outside, like what dosage of vitamin D. So some, you know, something I use. So I try to get it with Leo. I'll put the app on. Usually I think in Austin, it's not until 9 a.m., so that but it's always sunny here. So I'm thinking, oh, 730, we're outside in the diaper, we put his feet on the ground and it, the app is like, no, it's not now. So I, th I think it's cool. I found it from Empowered Autoimmune, someone I follow on Instagram. She's a big believer in um, not shying away from sun exposure on the skin. We're lucky. My husband, he's very British. So he like, he's very English. He's white and he turns red. But with Leo, um, 
besides when we're very close to the equator, I just typically like put him in his diaper and then he's outside. He's never burned before. Um, I don't love sunscreen. I, the mineral sunscreen is okay, but it's very sticky and white. And um, so I just put him outside and I use the app, but I get a lot of questions and I'm like, I can't give any recommendations. This is what works for us because he doesn't burn. But I love it because I can just turn the app on and I can do it for myself. Um, and then it reminds me, okay, I need to not wear leggings. I should wear, you know, like shorts or whatever. And it just tells you like wear less, wear less clothing or, or stuff like yeah. that. So it's kind of a cool app. Oh, I love that. <laughs> oh, I'm going to use that now. And I th- you made such a great point in that there are a lot of misconceptions about the ability to get enough vitamin D. Most people still think that even if they put sunscreen head to toe on their child, that they're getting plenty of vitamin D at the pool. And, you know, I, we'd run a lot of labs. And so I'll get labs back and I will say, well, your child's vitamin D level is 17 and that's very low. We need to supplement. We need to work on this. And they will just look at me very confused. Like, but we go to the pool every day for an hour or two hours. And, and then I kindly ask them, well, does your child have a long sleeve sun shirt on or sunscreen? Do you let them have any time without sunscreen? And they're like, well, no. And so we have to remember that that's sunblock. It is blocking the sun and it is blocking vitamin D. And so are all these swim shirts that kids are wearing. And so Mm -hmm. um, you have to have the majority of your body uncovered. So I always tell parents, you know, swim trunks for boys and swim suit for girls and then the rest of their body to see the sun. And it, like you said, I'm, I'm very much into letting my kids get sunshine and not, I'm not a huge sunscreen person. I mean, I will use it and I do use it, but I'm more about them needing that natural vitamin D. So, um, yeah, just knowing that, okay, if I'm putting sunscreen on my kids, all day long, they are not getting vitamin D from the sun. Yeah. And I, it's interesting that you say that because my family is South American and they, um, they're very like, I don't know, I guess the, the ethos, the medical ethos there is very different. And I asked my cousin, I was like, we're going to the Mexico, which is like our first time going to the beach. And I said, what do you do for the kids? And she's like, nothing just like don't put them out when the strong the sun is too strong and just monitor make sure their skin isn't burning but vitamin d is important they don't take any supplements but they're very much like out in nature and they do all the cold pressed juicing and the produce there hits different and all of that um but yeah she gave me that advice and then so i started doing the research on it and again it's like a controversial thing in the sense that we're told like make sure you cover up make sure buy the uv shirts super long sleeve and like put the hat on douse their faces if you're going on a walk like be careful, be fearful of the sun. Be fearful. That's right. Well, and the other thing that I will say, and I've experienced firsthand is if you are eating clean, Mm. you will burn almost never. I mean, you know, that is, that is a source of inflammation and a sign of inflammation for us having a sunburn. So the healthier your body is, the cleaner you're eating, the less you will burn. And I know that sounds really silly, but, um, you know, I think if people, I, I can say firsthand, I've experienced that. I know my husband has. And if you're doing, you know, working your way up time-wise in sunshine, then you'll do much better. Oh, that's really interesting. I feel like that's the case for so many things. Cause I was just talking to someone who, um, uh, the inventor of some EMF protection devices. And one of the big things that we learned or that I learned, if you will, um, so many important things, but one being like your diet and just being generally healthy is going to protect you. Um, obviously we still have to be cautious and careful and aware, but it's, it's the theme across everyone I talk to, whether they're an entrepreneur and they create some sort of something to help protect us or their practitioner, it's always like, just focus on your diet focus on keeping your inflammation at bay and you're going to be strong in the face of so many things. Um, So it's always a good point to come back to, but you know, in life, I feel like it's the simplest things are often the most effective. Mm -hmm. That's right. Diet, diet first, gut health, and then everything else to follow, you know? So what about gut health? Because I know we're, we could probably chat forever. Is there anything that um, parents who are listening and they're thinking, because you mentioned like probiotic rich food, um, are there any mm-hmm. other foods or any other things that we can you know have in mind or be doing to support our children when it comes to gut health? 
Sure. So, um, you know, we, we talked about inoculation at birth and C-section and, you know, if you do have a C-section and you're unable to do that inoculation piece, then um, infant probiotic, um, you know, a few times a week can be helpful for baby. Um, and then as you're introducing solids, some of my other favorite um, pre and probiotic foods are things like um, asparagus, jicama, banana, um, onion and garlic, which are not super common when you're introducing foods to babies. But um, and then you know, we talked a lot about sauerkraut. I like using the juice for babies because they obviously aren't going to sit there and munch on sauerkraut likely, but you can use a little bit of the juice, even if it's like half a teaspoon. Um, you know, even things like, um, kimchi juice and yogurts and kefirs, if you can make your own or buy them locally at the farmer's market. So I think, you know, more importantly, as always, if you can get it in the diet and not have to go and buy the supplement and, you know, be giving that every single day, then it's not only better absorbed and utilized in the gut, um, but then it's, you know, you're getting them that variety and they're learning that these foods are healthy and I like these foods. Totally. Yeah, you gave um, me that advice and we've been doing fun, well, because I love pickled things and so I was was wondering if my child would be the same and he happens to also love pickled things. So fermented foods tend to go down well, but that is very random because I'm sure most children are not like, yeah, yeah. I'll take a spoonful of sauerkraut, yeah. but maybe you got <laughs> that from me. I don't know. Um, but I love that advice that you gave because it was super practical and you can find that like anywhere that sells organic produce mm -hmm. even um, and just start bringing that into, you know, dessert. Like we now do a lot yeah. of yogurt and all that and kefir and it's super easy, a super easy, actionable tool that we could be using. Um, okay, so as we're rounding out here, is there anything that I know, again, like I could just ask you so many questions and go on so many tangents. Is there anything <laughs> else um, worth mentioning, something that's like actionable that parents can take from this and just like go ahead and start implementing, um, mm -hmm. yeah, to support their children's health? Yeah, so, you know, we talked a lot about prevention, but a lot of the kids that we see are, we're in this stage of kind of cleaning up and figuring out why they've had chronic issues. And so, of course, that first year of life, I think about chronic infection and ear infections are, are one of the big things. And so I would just encourage parents that if you are in that situation where you have a baby that is starting to get ear infection after ear infection or whatever infection it might be, that you start looking for the why, because it is not it's not normal for a child to need multiple antibiotics in those first couple of years. It shouldn't be normal. I know it, it probably you know we overuse these, but. Um, why are they getting sick or do they have food allergies or sensitivities that's contributing to the mucus that's contributing to their immune system uh, functioning the way it is? Um, is it something that I'm feeding my child? Um, is it that they are lacking in a certain nutrient that would really support their immune system to fight this off? Is my house full of mold? You know, there's so many questions that come to mind. That is what we do, the investigative piece of things. But I want to empower parents to look for those answers, you know. And a very good friend of mine recently was telling me about her three-year-old who's getting chronic sinusitis. And I, I said, you know, that is very uncommon, and especially sinusitis at this age, and to be needing back-to-back -back antibiotics, I really encourage you to figure out what's going on if he's eating something that is contributing to this or if there's more to this picture because that just doesn't sit well with me. Um, and so I think that I have to point that out before we leave because I want people to know that they can find answers for their kids. So people are going to wonder, where can they find a practitioner? How do they begin to look for a practitioner who understands how to dig deeper and can really guide them um, into answering these questions? So for people who are not in Texas, or even if they're in Texas and they're not close by, where, mm -hmm. where would they look? Okay, so my favorite two sites, um, one's going to be the Medical Academy of Pediatric Special Needs. 
Um, and that is where I've, I've run through their whole program. I'm a fellow of their program and they focus on pediatrics. So um, it's going to be, you know, if you find a provider on their listserv online, you will know that they've been pediatric trained um, to work with those with special needs, but also more of the things that we've been talking about, okay? And then the IFM, the Institute for Functional Medicine, is the second place. Um, and I've run through about half their program. Um, they are not pediatric focused, but they are functional medicine focused. So you have the ability to find a provider that has either been through part of their program or all of their program that will dive into functional medicine with you. So those are the two places that I send people all the time when they're looking for providers, especially out of state. So because I typically send people to the Institute of Functional Medicine. So I've not found anyone on there who, well, to be fair, I've never looked for anyone who's willing to work with children. I know like my practitioners specifically are like, do not work with children. So there are some people who are willing to, to run those tests on children and see children, even though they're not. Tra- okay. That's really good to know because there are so many people on that site as well. Yeah. It's a wonderful resource. And I think between those two sites, you can find someone in your definitely in your state, hopefully closer to where you're living and that will, you know, run tests for you and figure out the why for your child. Um, and I think that's like the big point that I, I, I said before, but I really want to like hammer home or whatever the saying is like, if something like that is going on, please do go get tested as much as we want to like help ourselves and help our kids and rush to the store and buy some supplements or do it. So-and-so put on the internet it's, it's not only like not safe, but it's not going to be effective if we don't know what's going on. So I really hope that this gives people tools where they'll go out and they'll feel empowered to find a practitioner. And at least now we have some questions that we can be asking them and making sure that this practitioner is also going to be looking in these places. So I say to my clients, like if we're, if your practitioner isn't talking about their diet, that's the red flag that they're not the right practitioner for you. Like that's an easy black and white thing that if they're not going to touch on it, if they're not going to talk about lifestyle, all of that. So hopefully people feel really empowered now to like ask these questions and look for these things while they're vetting their practitioners. But that being said, I think anyone on either of those resources would be asking those questions. So hopefully people are kind of good to go. Yes, absolutely. Okay, well, um, thank you so much for this. Um, This was so, so awesome. I was just writing down a lot of those resources that you shared. So I'm just going to pop those in the show notes, especially um, those recipes so people can get started right away with implementing a lot of these um, nutrient-dense foods and all of that. Um, But yeah, I just really, really appreciate your time. um, And it was so awesome chatting. Thank you, Faith. This was so fun. And I hope that all of our listeners have gained some new knowledge that they didn't have before.